We're pleased today to have uh, Nuno Battaglia with us. I'm not even sure if I'm saying your name correctly. Okay. Uh, he's a partner at Public Development Partners, a real estate development firm specializing in turnkey solutions for uniquely complex projects, both in public and private sectors. Uh, with projects covering a broad spectrum of size and scope, including infrastructure, justice, city center revitalizations, and hospitality. And Nuno received a BA and an MBA from BYU. Was it in international relations, your BA here at BYU? Okay. And uh, where he was designated a Cook Scholar, Cook International Scholar, and a Hawes Scholar, the highest distinction from the Marriott School of Management. So we're very pleased today to have Nuno with us. and. Uh, Hope our time together will be pleasant. Thank you, Nuno, for coming. OK, thank you. Thanks for, thanks for having me. Well, um, it wasn't too long ago, it feels like. I was uh, sitting here in the Kennedy Center going through, I'm sure, s similar things that you're, you're, you're going through right now. And, and um, uh, as I prepared this this presentation uh, today, I was uh, I was instructed and directed to focus more on um, experiences that are relevant to you, more so than on policy issues. I've got some passion for some policy issues that I'd love to dis uh, discuss today, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll keep those out of our. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> But uh, so 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 as I as I've put this uh, presentation together, I, I try to think about um, the kinds of things that might be helpful to you. Uh, and I, as you're sitting in where you are today, you're you're, you're considering career options. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have started families. Some of you will start families soon. Um, and and you're thinking about uh, uh, you know what to do uh, with your futures uh, as far as your profession. Um, I, I would say that uh, my background is very non-traditional and and um, um, and I, I would hope that some of the things that I uh, present to you in terms of the experiences I've had. And the things that uh, that I've done and, and have seen, that perhaps one of those or some of those will, will prompt some thoughts in your in your minds and prompt you to research a, th a certain area that perhaps was was not on your uh, on your radar. So with that in mind, let me just try to click through this. Uh, I was born in, in Portugal, just by way of introduction, in 1965. I was born uh, in the middle of a a dictatorship, a 48-year dictatorship by Antonio de Oliveira Salazar. Uh, he was uh, uh, branded by Time Magazine as the dean of dictators in Europe. Uh, his motto, one of his models was that the people have more need to be governed than to be free. So that was the environment I was raised in or born into. Um, born uh, Catholic, 95% of the population in Portugal at the time was Catholic. In 1969, when I was four, my family moved to Angola, one of our colonies, uh, Portuguese colonies, uh, in search of better opportunity for, for the family. Uh, I had an idyllic upbringing in a beautiful colonial setting. Um, I loved uh, and am still nostalgic about it. Uh, that uh, upbringing came to a screeching halt in 1974 when Portugal overthrew its dictatorship with a coup uh, by, by the military and overthrew uh, Salazar's regime. The military provisional government that was installed to govern the country moved quickly to give independence to the colonies. Uh, many colonies we had in Africa and Asia received independence almost overnight in a very chaotic fashion, and civil war broke in virtually um, all the colonies. Angola was not an exception. In fact, uh, Angola's civil war was the worst of all the colonies' civil wars, and you know, with uh, millions of people uh, killed and displaced. <laughs> and, uh, sorry. <laughs> Dan, how are you? <laughs> And um, 
and, and, and that uh, caused my family to return back to Portugal. Um, I, was, I was 10 years uh, at the time. Uh, we had a very rough time. Um, our family uh, settled, uh, finally settled in the south of Portugal. I was uh, then at, at age 13, a new chapter started in our lives. I joined the church. Missionaries uh, contacted my family. And, and I served a mission. I was one of the first few missionaries uh, to serve from Portugal. Served at home. And uh, in 86, immediately after my mission, I was drafted into the Portuguese military, served for two years in the Marines as an officer. And after which, I was able to then come and pursue the goal I had ever since I had met the missionaries, which was to come to BYU. Um, so I came here uh, in 88 to pursue a degree in international relations. I figured that someone who was Italian, born in Portugal, brought up in Angola, uh, it was now in the United States, should do something in international relations. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, I always had an interest in business, and so I, I focused my, my, my uh, studies here on economics. That was my emphasis. And in fact, I pursued an MBA uh, at the business school here in 1995. Uh, I came back for that. Okay, let me just introduce you my family. This is my wife, Karen, from Colorado. Um, we have seven children. We've lived in Portugal and Florida and California. We now live in Alpine, Utah. Our daughter, uh, 21, Kaylee, she's serving a mission in, in Guatemala, Quetzaltenango, just started three months ago. Uh, Philip, our German uh, adopted son, he uh, just received his, his mission call to, to England, Birmingham. Uh, Ryan is putting in his papers, so we'll have three on a mission pretty soon. Joel, Chase, Ian, Sophia, and so that's our family. Uh, it's uh, obviously, as it is for you, the uh, most important part of my life. Um, uh, your families, that is, uh, as mine is for me. Um, yeah, this thing about... Um, you know, getting uh, joy in your in your posterity. I tell you, it comes after a lot of uh, pain in your posterior. <laughs> and uh, we are going through that process right now. We're experiencing a little bit of joy as the kids grow up and, and uh, make good decisions and move on. Uh, but we're still in the middle of the pain also. <laughs> uh, okay, so so my, my route, in, you know, my career, um, uh, so it started here in international relations. Um, when, when I was in the middle of the program here, I got a phone call from my brother who was in Portugal and with an opportunity to, um, to work with a, fan, a French manufacturer of consumer products. They were looking to expand in the United States and my brother uh, gave me this idea and I dropped out of school, um, flew to Paris, uh, over a course of, uh, of, of a couple of days, I negotiated a joint venture with them. They selected me as the CEO in, in the United States for this expansion that they were trying to do. And uh, I got on the plane back uh, to the United States, you know, elated about what had just happened. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I was completely unprepared. Uh, I did not have the proper training. Um, did not have the experience, the background that was required, uh, and we didn't have uh, proper financial backing. And it's a recipe really for, for, for failure. Um, learned a lot in that process. Um, and so hopefully what I, what I want to do here today with you is, is um, y y you know, y y we don't have to make mistakes uh, just because we haven't had the success. I mean, we can, we can we can avoid mistakes, uh, or the experience, I should say. We can avoid mistakes by looking at other people's experiences and learn from them. And hopefully I can share some of those learnings with you uh, today as well. Okay, so I if I had to do it over, uh, if I and if I was sitting in your situation, again, as I was back then, uh, I would have considered some things that I hadn't even considered at the time because I didn't know they were available or they, or, or they existed. Um, I would have taken more business classes. I, I would have, um, uh, you know, some of you are sitting here uh, maybe uh, 
you know, some of you want to do policy kinds of issues, you know, the kinds of things. Others may want to do more business-focused things. Um, for those of you who have an interest in business or have an interest in working in any way with business, if you don't know accounting, if you don't know how to read financial statements, you're going to be at a big disadvantage. Uh, so you may sit there, here and say, you know, I, I hate accounting. I can't do accounting. I just can't do it. Um, well, I, I, I would propose that you change your perspective or, or, or consider that accounting in and of, it, in of itself it is, it is painful. I mean, I, you know, accounting, I hate accounting. It's painful. But if you don't know the language of business, if you don't know how to read a financial statement, you're going to be at a big disadvantage. So you, you, need, to, you need to have that perspective. Um, I, I would have tried to get an internship rather than rush through my education uh, without taking a break in the summer and pursuing an internship or even during, uh, you know, on the site instead of just getting a job that's, that's, um, uh, that has nothing or little to do with what you're going to be doing in the future. Tr try to look for opportunities in areas that interest you and look for an internship uh, especially, you should look for an internship with a company that's growing and it's progressive. That's something that's very valuable. Uh, in that process, you should focus on learning how to read financial statements, uh, how to do feasibility studies, um, how to size markets, uh, do financial modeling, uh, how to market products, position, set prices, uh, how to you know, even run business operations. Again, it depends on what, what you're, you're really interested in. But at this point, remember, at this point, the word university really means, you know, a, a breadth of scope. It's not so much uh, uh, specialization. So at this point in your careers, you want to have, you want to have open, openness to a number of disciplines to really test and see what interests you and what you're good at. Uh, and then I would, I would suggest you graduate. You finish what you start, <laughs> OK? Uh, which I eventually did, by the way. OK. Um, OK, so upon graduation, so that was, you know, as I, if I had to go through the program again, what I, what I would have done differently. Upon graduation, what I would have considered that I didn't at the time because I didn't know these things were available or they were out there or, or that I had interest in them because I hadn't had exposure to them, uh, one thing that I would consider, and again, this is for me, for my personal, my, for my personal experience, I would, I would have considered a job in, in strategy consulting. If you haven't looked into strategy consulting and if you have interest in business, you should do some research. These are some of the top firms in strategy consulting. It's very competitive, extremely difficult to get a job. You pretty much have to be close to the top of your class in order to be considered. Um, uh, it's a lot easier with, with the Deloitte's and the PricewaterhouseCoopers and Ernst & Young's and KPMG's to get a management consulting job and not so, n not a s a strictly uh, or uh, um, um, a s a strategy consulting. Uh, but you, you do need to have good grades. You need to, you need to you know, think well on your feet and, and interview well and so on. But I, if I had interest in, in, in business, I would consider doing this out of school. It's extremely important. You know, it would be a great experience to have. Um, some of you, if you have interest in investment banking, the, the business school has great resources for networking and uh, for mentoring, um, venture capital, private equity, very difficult fields to break into and to get, and to get a job in. Uh, but they're very interesting and in, in they can accelerate your, your learning about business, business and set up your career on a, on a tra trajectory and a path that otherwise it wouldn't be. Uh, and and, and a, a way often to, to get into venture capital and private equity is to really look for opportunities with companies that are uh, growth oriented or progressive or have uh, disruptive services or products in the marketplace. A lot of them are venture backed or will be venture backed at some point uh, or backed by private equity. Uh, regardless, you can develop expertise in areas that are hot uh, in areas that, in, that also uh, interest you, and, and it can make you attractive to uh, venture capitalists or, or private equity groups in the future, if that's of interest to you. Uh, realize that most of these jobs will not be advertised. It's very important for you to network. Um, and and w 
what I would do before I would approach anybody for a job or with looking for a job, I would, I would learn about the company, learn about the problems, the opportunities they're facing, and then I would, I would uh, uh, position a presentation to the company with what might be of help, what might be of value in view of the company's uh, opportunities and struggles that they're, they're, they may be facing. Uh, again, here, an internship during school becomes very important because it can set you up for one of these opportunities. In fact, the intern, uh, the, the, the company that hired you to be an intern might, as, might uh, extend to you a permanent uh, full-time offer. I would not discount uh, international experience. In fact, I would, I would very much um, encourage you to consider international experiences. Uh, the, the BRIC countries, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, these are really large economies, very, very large economies that are growing very, very rapidly. And if, if no question that there, there's, there, there are challenges in, in, in negotiating, you know, your way through um, some of these opportunities. But I, I, would, I would try to, uh, I, I would keep my mind open for that. So consider Africa, for example. Do, do, this comes from The Economist. Uh, during the past 10 years, six of the world's fastest growing economies were in sub-Saharan Africa. Africa has always been an afterthought for businesses. Uh, not, not so anymore. In fact, do you know who is in full force taking advantage of Africa and opportunities there is, uh, are the Chinese. The Chinese are um, uh, uh, very, very uh, well established in most of these economies in Africa in, in, in taking advantage of the opportunities there. Uh, the Economist projects that in the next five years, seven African economies will grow at a 7.2% average growth uh, rate. Do you know what that means? I mean, do you guys have a sense for 7.2%? I mean, clearly, the, the incomes, it's a ton. The incomes are small, so there's a lot of room for growth. But, but with growth, there's opportunity. Does that make sense? Uh, by 2030, The Economist predi uh, predi predicts that Africa's new middle class will be 300 million people. That's all of the United States. Um, and two point, consuming $2.2 trillion in, go in goods and services. So um, some of the economies, some of the countries you might look at, some of these, these are some of the hottest countries. Angola, where I grew up, 5.9% growth rate, uh, $4,300 in per capita income. Sure, you look at the, the size of the middle class, relatively small, uh, but you know, it's still six and a half million people. That's a lot of people. Uh, Botswana, uh, not quite as large, but uh, fast economic growth, more stable economy, $6,200 in per capita income. Ghana is another interesting country. I have a friend who went to Ghana to do gold mining. Um, he was having a hard time here, and uh, he, he, he uh, he uh, created this opportunity. He, uh, he showed up and uh, started negotiating with the Ministry of, uh, of Mining, got some concessions to do alluvial mining in, in Ghana, and basically positioned himself now where he has a leasing company. He leases heavy equipment, heavy machinery to, uh, to uh, basically Chinese and, uh, and Middle Easterners who are now mining Gold, a uh, gold in, in 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 full force in in uh, in Ghana, and doing very well. Uh, Nigeria is another uh, country with incredible growth. Thirty-four million people is the size of the middle class. One hundred fifty-two million people. South Africa, an economy that's uh, uh, I'm sure none to you. Okay, so um, so back to my my experience. So I, when, I, I, uh, when I came to BYU to pursue an MBA, uh, um, I, had, I had the following objectives. I wanted uh, to focus my uh, uh, business career internationally. Uh, I was looking for, for training that uh, uh, very much I, I knew I needed. Um, and I was looking for a, a change in direction in my career. I wanted opportunities to open up to me, but I, I didn't have a clear direction when I started the program. 
uh, after I started the program, I became uh, aware of and interested in, stra in strategy consulting, uh, only to find out that uh, BYU did really does not place well with strategy consulting firms. Um, now, I should let me tell you that the, the undergraduate programs are BYU, in fact, I think is a top five school with, uh, with the top strategy consulting firms um, for undergraduates, but not so for business school. Um, uh, BYU is strong in corporate finance, operations, accounting, entrepreneurship, areas that um, uh, weren't really in my, in my, uh, in my interest portfolio. Um, I did land an internship with Otis Elevator Company in Lisbon, Portugal. Had a fantastic experience in Portugal with my family, and and uh, uh, and, and the internship itself was very valuable. Uh, it did teach me, however, that I don't like corporate finance, <laughs> and so I did not take a job with um, with Otis Elevator when I left, even though I had an offer. Um, um, I, I was recruited by a company called Lucadia National Corporation, and I took a job with them. And I'll get back to them in a second. Uh, if I had to do business school over again, uh, these are some of the things I would have considered that I didn't at the time, um, uh, again, because I, I didn't have the perspective I have today. Uh, I would try to define my end, my end goal first, better than I did before, and I would begin with that end in mind. So identify your field of interest. It's important. When you get to business school, it's Im that's why it's important for you to, and I suggest it's strategy consulting or management consulting or, or internships that expose you to a number of areas uh, of potential interest because it's important for you to start, you know, you start broad and, and, and you, you want to start, um, um, you know, defining in, 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 in your career as you, as you progress and not and, and not live not let um, you know circumstances determine what that is. Um, so find a program that matches that field. So for example, if you're interested in marketing, Northwestern is a great school. And, and these are just examples, okay? Um, just so you, you, you see what I'm talking about. So strategy consulting, if that's your interest, you may want to consider a top 20, 25 program. Um, if you want to do venture capital, private equity, uh, some of the top schools. Uh, you know, would place would place well there. Investment banking, NYU, Wharton, MIT would be would be schools that I would consider. Corporate finance, BYU is a great option. Uh, accounting, um, again, some some other schools. I would consider, however, going somewhere else other than than what you do your 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 undergraduate. Um, it, it's good to to have the experience that multiple uh, universities can bring to you. Um, I would also consider the strength of the alumni network. Uh, once you have your degree, look, BYU is going to train you just as well as Harvard. I have no question about that in terms of the fundamentals. Um, uh, but the strength of the Harvard uh, alumni network uh, is, is really difficult to match. So you need to, you need to consider those things. Uh, you need to consider also... Uh, uh, I, I would consider, which I didn't at the time, uh, going and pursuing a degree overseas. I mean, there's some some outstanding business schools out there. These are some of the top ranked in the world, uh, according to Financial Times. The rankings are are there. Uh, I would also consider the value of the program, uh, if in, in in the context of what you want to do professionally. I mean, if you're going to make it, if if you're going to make, you know, sixty thousand dollars a year because that's, that's what you want to do, then you, you, you really can't afford to get hundreds of thousands of dollars in debt to pursue a degree at one of the top, uh, one of the top business schools in the world. So you need to, you need to decide, decide that. And BYU is always number one in terms of value. There's no question about that. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, um, the, ticker symbol for, the ticker symbol for Lucadia... It's traded, publicly traded on New York Stock Exchange's LUK. And I did luck out into getting a job at Lucadia. Um, uh, I was, as I said, I was recruited by a headhunter. Uh, I really didn't, didn't pursue him. But, uh, but it turns out it was, a, it was a, a, an incredible opportunity for me. Uh, Lucadia is similar to Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett's company. It's much smaller. It's about $8 billion in assets. 
but it's highly diversified with lots of interests in lots of businesses in all over the world. It's really a global company. And uh, as, as much as I was interested in international, um, uh, in, in, uh, in doing business internationally, well, Lucadia, I couldn't have picked a better, a better position to do that. Uh, I spent a year commuting to Southeast Asia. To, uh, I, I spent a lot of time in Russia and Africa, uh, some time in Latin America. And I was, I was looking at deals. Um, some of the deals I worked on included, um, a, a, we did lots of insurance uh, kinds of acquisitions, in, in, including we bought the, the stake. We're, we're the majority holder of the largest style insurance company in the world. Um, I invested in an Indonesia oil and gas company. I um, oversaw investments in Southeast Asia, both in Japan and outside of Japan. Um, I was CFO equivalent to a, a developer, a real estate developer in California that was doing a very large project in the city of San Leo Hills in San Diego County, 3,400 homes. It was, it was really a town that we developed, and I, I did the, uh, a lot of the uh, heavy lifting on the finance side for, for, for the critical two years of the launch of that project. Um, assisted with the uh, restructure of of one of our insurance groups in New York that was defunct. In fact, we ran it, we ran it off. We ran the book off and closed it, shut down the business. Uh, fired eight, flo eight floors full of people. Uh, and managed um, our investments in very complex financial instruments uh, that, that were the precursor to some of the instruments that were used on Wall Street that caused, the, we're at the root of the crisis that we're facing now. Uh, and the last project I worked on at Lucadia was, was in joint venture with Berkshire Hathaway. It was, in, it was a, um, the, re, uh, the restructuring of, of uh, the largest public default to date. It was an $11 billion default um, of, a, of a company called Finova Capital Group that went bankrupt. And we, we managed the reorganization of the company. Okay, um, 2002, I left Lucadia to, to start with two partners of business. So I felt more encouraged now with the training I had received here and with the experiences I had at Lucadia. So I wanted to tackle a really big problem. So how do we save healthcare? Um, and this is, a pro this is not a new problem, right? I mean, healthcare is a big problem today, right? It's, it's, it's not new. It's been, it's been a problem for 20 years, for 30 years. In fact, 20 years ago, when uh, uh, you, you'll recall, there was a, there was a push to get, um, 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 to get a you know, nationalization of, of health care. And it's taken, it's taken this long for a, a bill like the a recent one that, that just passed. Um, at Health Equity, our mission is really to, to drive consumerism into the health care which we think is the, is the key to the solution. Um, so so uh, Health Equity now is the number one non-bank trustee of health savings accounts. I'll mention what this means in a second. Uh, we have about, uh, we have close to $650 million in deposits. We're the largest non-bank trustee in the country and the fastest growing consumer-driven healthcare company in the country. Have you heard the term consumer-driven healthcare? Okay, so this is, this is it's, it's not a new movement. It's a movement that's been at bay for at least a half a dozen years in this country. It really started in 2002 with the enactment of health savings accounts. And we were lucky, prescient a little bit, but mostly lucky that we started our business right as Congress enacted this law. We felt that there was a movement at bay towards it, but we didn't know it was going to be that fast. Anyway, we've been able to take advantage of that because we were positioned right at the beginning, and we've become the, uh, the fastest growing and largest cons independent consumer-driven healthcare company in the country. We're based in Draper, Utah. We have uh, over 150 employees, and we have a, an impressive roster of, of employers that use our service. 
and we have uh, contracts with dozens of insurance companies around the country that use our service uh, with very uh, uh, good prospects for growth as the penetration into these groups is, has been very small so far, growing rapidly, but there's a lot of space to, to grow. Okay, uh, so how much time do we have? Oh, uh, I'm not sure. We usually try to wrap up at five, but since we got started late, people may be able to stay a little extra. Okay, well, I, I want to make sure that, uh, it, it, you know, I, I may be talking about things that are not interesting at all, and, and, uh, and I'd, I'd, I want to make sure to leave time for questions and answers. So, uh, but l let me just mention health equity and what's, what's behind health equity, what's behind consumer-driven health care. This is a simple supply-demand uh, uh, chart in uh, inequ equilibrium. Uh, you know, in, in, in a marketplace for cars, for clothing, for food, I mean, even for things that, that, that are um, very much essential, you know, housing, um, you know, clothing, food, I mean, you, you have a market that's out there trying to figure out where to set prices. You, you don't have a centralized power or a third party that's setting prices for you, right? So what happens in healthcare is quite different because there's so much government intervention in healthcare and because there is so much uh, of a third party emphasis on the payment of claims, what happens is that, um, is that uh, the patient ends up paying uh, a price that's well below, so P2 here represents the price that the customer or the patient tends to pay because the bulk of it is paid by third parties, insurance companies, employers, by, um, by the government. So what happens is that uh, you, you have a shift in, in, in I mean, you have, you, you have, you have overutilization of services because prices are uh, artificially lowered for consumers. So at that quantity, then you, you have, you, you know, if you're demanding that quantity of services, what are suppliers going to do? They're going to charge a higher price because that's a price at which they're willing to, to supply. So w what you have is you have a shift in the pricing from, from P1 to P3 uh, as, uh, as a result of the artificial intervention by third parties in the marketplace. So what consumer-driven healthcare does, it allows market forces to drive consumer decisions. That's really at the, at the core of consumer-driven healthcare. So what, what do you do? You raise the, 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 the insurance deductible to catastrophic levels. So from, say, $3,000 to $10,000. You guys know what a deductible is? Mm -hmm. So a deductible is the amount of money at which the insurance company starts paying after you pay the amount of the deductible out of your own pocket. Does that make sense? So the higher the deductible, the more catastrophic is the policy, meaning that you know, a $10,000 policy is you, you have to be really sick to spend $10,000, or you have to have something that doesn't happen every year. Uh, unless you you have a chronic condition, so that that additional exposure in this example is seven thousand dollars. Okay, the insurance premiums again. This is just an illustration, so don't don't hold me to these numbers. These this is just an illustration, but it's pretty true to form. The insurance premiums go down significantly. In this example, uh, we're going to suggest from fifteen thousand to eight to, to uh, eight thousand dollars. So you're going to save seven thousand dollars, right? So you, you've increased your exposure by $7,000 here by, go, by uh, raising a deductible. But you just saved $7,000 because, um, uh, because your premiums went down as a result of the higher deductible. Did you understand that? Mm -hmm. The higher the deductible, the lower the premium. Think about your automobile insurance. You guys have automobile insurance, right? So the higher the deductible, the lower the premium. So what you do, you, you take that savings, deposit in a health savings account. It's, uh, it's tax-free in, tax-free growth, tax-free tax out. It's not perfect. It's part of our imperfect tax system. But it, it, uh, it's, it's the best thing that we have in the tax code to drive consumerism in healthcare. And, and about 80% of the consumers um, 
their 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 average interaction with with the, with the, with the with the healthcare system is is less than ten thousand dollars a year. You have a question? Is so health equity is providing the health savings accounts, or is it also providing the catastrophic insurance? We just do the health savings account. Good question. Then we partner with insurance companies that do. That's a very regulated space. That um, uh, and, and you know, and when we started, we 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 were trying to decide whether the insurance company or a bank. We decided to become neither. To be. Uh, at the at the fulcrum of both, at the intersection of both, and that's what we do. So what health equity does, and, I'll, and, and we'll, we'll get to that in a second. What health equity does, then it, it, it in this out of whack system, right? Health equity lowers utilization by by um, uh, see if if eighty eighty percent of the time you're operating over here, right? If you have a high level health plan without copays, so in other words, every time you go to the doctor, the doctor charges $150, you pay out of your own account, right? So you have an incentive to go shop or go when it's convenient, go when it's proper for you to go at $150, right? Not at $25, does that make sense? Okay, so you're operating in this, in this box right here 80% of the time, that's what health equity tries to do anyway. So we lower utilization naturally by doing that, and we also lower the price because now, if you're driving utilization down, then you're going to be operating in the supply cur curve somewhere down here closer to your equilibrium pricing. Does that make sense? So you go from a total cost to the system of that big box to that's the total cost of the, to the system. Does that make sense? Question. Well, how did you do it before? How did that poor person do before? Well, because they have that the Medicare and all those plans that are helping them. Okay. So isn't that a big chunk of what the government's paying for? It, it is. It is. Now, the change we're affecting here, the change we're affecting is, is in, in health plans or in, in, in employers that have health plans that have low, relatively low in, in, uh, deductibles. Does that make sense? So, health plan, you know, in, employers that are now planning fifteen thousand dollars a month, or I'm sorry, fifteen thousand dollars a year, for the premiums of their employees, if they if they raise the deductible, and they save ten seven thousand dollars, they can put that money into an account that is the employee's account, and they can start by they can start to drive the cost of the care down and utilization to proper levels. Okay. This, this doesn't solve the problem for people who don't have insurance. However, in this model, maybe you can't afford a $15,000 policy, but you can't afford a $7,000 or $8,000 policy that has a very high deductible. So it keeps you from going bankrupt, right? And, and when, when you're operating down here, so if you have to go to the doctor, and it's, 100, it's $150, um, it can be a hardship for people, but the idea is that they will have a health savings account they can they can uh, uh, use for those kinds of those kinds of needs. Does that make sense? Okay, uh, so I'll just breeze through this quickly. So health equity is then it really offers these these tools. It's um, it's an integrated pl platform. We have we have a twenty four seven service that's incredibly uh, needed in this space because people don't know how to how to use the system, you know, to go from a non, you know, complete third party payment type of system to uh, a system where you have to make decisions about healthcare. Um, and there are these incredible teaching moments uh, where, you know, when people call to activate their card, their, their healthcare account, we can teach them about how to use it. When they, um, uh, when they call to make contributions into the account, we can take those opportunities to teach people how to become better consumers of healthcare. Okay, so uh, we integrate with the insurance companies. We provide a we provide a page that allows for the insurance company to co-brand. So when the um, insured goes to their homepage, they they feel like they're at, they're at, they're at the insurance company's page, except it's powered by Health Equity. Um, so you can you can make payments directly from 
from your health savings account, or you can make payments. You can add payment. You can add uh, options. You can add accounts that are not health savings account uh, to your uh, to your um, to your platform. So you can make payments outside of the health savings account as well using our platform. You can make payments directly to providers. The insurance company reprices the claims. You can pay out of your health savings account. And it keeps records for, that are important for taxes and, and, and for, your, for the future. If you have more than $2,000 in the account, you can make investments. We have a, a family of, of 12 mutual funds that you can make investments into, all seamless, done from your... Okay, so some of the things that uh, I learned at Health Equity, some of the things we did. We seeded the company with, 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 with our own money, friends, family, and fools. Um, our last round was, uh, was venture capital money. We raised a total of $24 million in three up rounds. Um, we, we did it uh, in, in, a, in a reasonable fashion, uh, and we're successful in doing that. Uh, I'll just skip my current experience. You guys may, can, can ask me questions about this if you're interested. Let me just, some of the lessons I learned in, in, in my career that maybe you can uh, learn from some of my mistakes and some of my experience. Um, you, you know, the days of, of expecting to get a job uh, and, and having a job f for life or security in, in, the, in the marketplace, unless you're a, new, a university professor, <laughs> um, those, those don't really exist, um, or very few and far between. You really have to focus on creating value and being and thinking outside the box. Um, I learned to hire slowly and fire quickly. This is counterintuitive to most people. Most people like to hire quickly and take a long time before making a firing decision. I, I found that uh, once the question comes into your mind as to the value of someone in your organization, um, it's probably time for them to, look, to go. And, and it's better for them and better for you and better for the whole, uh, for the whole organization. Uh, be careful of partnerships. They have some real risks. Uh, people have differing objectives, and objectives do change over time. And that can lead to a lack of unity. And lack of unity, if, if not fixed, uh, leads to a lack of trust, which uh, eventually leads to failure of any organization. I've, found, I, I've seen more f companies fail from, from within than from without. Um, this is a rule I didn't, I didn't uh, learn until, um, until much later um, through painful experience, that it takes twice the time and four times the money to launch any business or to launch any, any venture. You might, you, might, um, you might think you have a pretty good grasp on, on the costs and on the timelines, but... Um, uh, I've found that it typically takes twice the time and four times the money. Uh, something I've also learned is that you can spend a lot of time on a strategy, try to get the perfect strategy. You know, it's, it's a lot more important in my experience to have perfect execution or very good execution than to have a, a, a perfect strategy. Uh, it's, t it's, it's important to have a strategy, but you don't need to have the perfect strategy to be successful, uh, but it's very important to execute to that strategy perfectly. That makes sense. Um, I've also learned that the people who are successful, they tend to be passionate about the fundamentals of a business or an industry and not passionate about, a money, about the money. Uh, I, I, I always get uh, leery of people. In fact, I, just this week, I had someone pitch me a project that, um, uh, you, you know, their 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 goal is to is to flip it. It's to it's to have an exit strategy. It's to you know monetize the investment quickly. Um, I found that money follows the fundamentals, but not the other way around. Does that make sense? And I've also learned that family comes first, in that order. And if you get that confused, you'll you'll be in you'll be in a world of hurt. Are there questions? It's been a pleasure to visit with you. Hopefully this has been helpful to at least some of you. Any questions?
Thank you. Yeah. Um, actually, I have a couple of questions. Uh, I'd like you to talk about how, a little bit more about how you manage family. You have a large family, obviously. Uh, how you manage that with you know, a successful career. And then, um, I'll just ask the second question. Then, so. Well, you know, it's, um, it's hard and you have to focus. You have to focus on it. Um, one, one of my bosses at Lucadia, um, he, um, you know, not LDS, but uh, just a, a great man. Um, uh, he went through a divorce, and um, he had he had two young boys at home. He made it a point any anywhere he was in the world during the week, he was going to be home at Friday night. On fr Friday night, he was not going to stay away for the weekend. So that was, you know, that was something that was important to him. In my career. Um, I was. I found myself commuting to Southeast Asia for a, for a year, um, and when you go to Southeast Asia, you you you, you go. F you know, there's you know, 12, 13 hour difference uh, in the schedules and or in the time th time zones, and you can't go for a week or a few days. I mean, you you, you pretty much are committed to go for a couple of weeks. Um, that was very hard on the kids. I had uh, our our three year old, five year old at the time. It was it was really hard on them. And um, I, in, I eventually, that, that was one of the reasons that led me to, uh, to leave Lucadia, was to, was to cut back on my travel. So you have to make some hard decisions. Um, you, you know, you, you, sometimes you have to decide, and often I've found, you have to decide between, between two good things. You know, you have to decide between... Um, you know, th that extra push at work or whatever project you're working on or some or something you know calling at church um or or uh or spending time with your kids or taking your wife on a date and um and and, and often it's it's difficult to 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 do unless you prioritize in advance um I don't know. I think if you had asked my kids, um, I think they, I think they, I would hope that they, you know, it's it's been interesting also because we've had we've had times. I mean, I, I had a I had a two years span of time that where I was spending a lot of time with the kids. You know, we bought an RV and traveled and did a lot of things together. Uh, there have been times where you know when we launched Health Equity, I rarely saw them. You know, for for you know during the week. You know, you gotta, you gotta. Sometimes you, you, you sometimes are, 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 are better than others. But I don't know. I, I think I've done okay. I mean, I think we've been able to. The kids have, and my wife haven't kicked me out of the house yet. 